A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and the prophets, these were men who through faith conquered kingdoms, did what is right and earned the promises. They could keep a lion's mouth shut, put out blazing fires and emerge unscathed from battle. They were weak people who were given strength to be brave in war and drive back foreign invaders. Some, back, some came back to their wives from the dead by resurrection, and others submitted to torture, refusing release, so that they would rise again to a better life. Some had to bear being pilloried or flogged or even chained up in prison. They were stoned or sawn in half or beheaded. They were homeless and dressed in the skins of sheep and goats. They were penniless and were given nothing but ill treatment. They were too good for the world, and they went out to live in deserts and mountains and in caves and ravines. These are all heroes of faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had made provision for us to have something better, and they were not to reach perfection except with us. The word of the Lord. The response to the psalm is, let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. How great is the goodness, Lord, that you keep for those who fear you, that you show to those who trust you in the sight of men. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. You hide them in the shelter of your presence from the plotting of men. You keep them safe within your tent from disputing tongues. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Blessed be the Lord who has shown me the wonders of his love in a fortified city. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. I am far removed from your sight, I said in my alarm. Yet you heard the voice of my plea when I cried for help. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Love the Lord, all you saints. He guards the faithful, but the Lord will repay to the full those who act with pride. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Your word is truth, O Lord. Consecrate us in the truth. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples reached the country of the Gerasenes on the other side of the lake, and no sooner had he left the boat than a man with an unclean spirit came out from the tomb towards him. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could secure him any more, even with a chain, because he had often been secured with fetters and chains, but had snapped the chains and broken the fetters, and no one had the strength to control him. All night and all day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he would howl and gash himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and fell at his feet and shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear by God you will not torture me. For Jesus had been saying to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. What is your name? Jesus asked. My name is Legion, he answered, for there are many of us. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the district. Now there were there on the mountainside a great herd of pigs feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us to the pigs, let us go into them. So he gave them leave. With that, the unclean spirits came out and went into the pigs and the herd of about 2,000 pigs charged down the cliff into the lake, and there they were drowned. The swineherds ran off and told their story in the town and in the country round about, and the people came to see what had really happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his full senses, the very man who had had the legion in him before, and they were afraid. Those who had witnessed it reported what had happened to the demoniac and what had become of the pigs. 
Then they began to implore Jesus to leave the neighbourhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed begged to be allowed to stay with him. Jesus would not let him, but said to him, Go home to your people and tell them all that the Lord in his mercy has done for you. So the man went off and proceeded to spread throughout the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. The Gospel of the Lord. I think it's legitimate occasionally to see the sort of twinkle of God's sense of humor. Uh, we have a sense of humor. Um, and where does that come from? It must come from God. If it's good, uh, it also means that God, in everything, God is eternal. So God has a sort of infinite, eternal sense of humor. Perhaps that's a feature of God we don't contemplate very much. Um, I know the Irish particularly have brought that into religion. The amount of times I've seen that beautiful blend that you find often in an Irish priest of being able to, uh, to blend uh, just a healthy, wholesome sense of humor, not, not one that victimizes someone, um, but allows a sort of a little twinkle into the way of, of, uh, of, um, of understanding the, the great truths of the faith, very serious things. So in a sense, the humor helps to, to convey it. I remember once hearing a sermon from an Irish priest, I think I've probably told this before, but I like the story. Uh, he, he, uh, he was talking about the new atheism. All the, all the people now write into books about the new atheism. And he said, and I said, sure, I haven't heard that they want a feast day for their atheism. They, they say, you've got Christmas and you've got Easter. We want a feast day. He said, actually, you've already got one. It's April Fool's Day. And uh, I think that's the way that the Irish can sort of get round big spiritual truths um, uh, with, with, with the gift of humour. Now, why say all of that? Uh, well, partly because we honour St. Bridget today, patron of Ireland, uh, in thanksgiving for the, the, the great fruitfulness of the faith that has come out from Ireland over the centuries. But also because of this gospel. Whenever I read this gospel account, I try and picture what's actually going on, the kind of mayhem, uh, the first the demoniac, and then the whole business with 2,000 pigs. I mean, that's a lot of pigs to see running down a hillside, all throwing themselves into a lake. I mean, just the whole scene seems kind of pandemonium. But there's Jesus calmly in the middle of it all, uh, just doing what he does, liberating from evil. We were looking at that in, in terms of yesterday's gospel, that fundamental characteristic of the good news come to liberate us from the, the confusion, the, the, the destructive power of evil, or sort of seeming power of evil, and Jesus calmly pursuing uh, that, seeing the value of this one individual, this one poor man who's somehow, we don't know his history, but so overcome with evil that he's gashing himself with stones, he's destroying himself, he's no longer the image of God that he was created to be, uh, or in the image of God. And Jesus sees that one individual in the midst of all this chaos, but somehow there's, there's something funny about this, I don't know what it is, but uh, it, it it, it, it happens anyway. So we, we, we're to draw deep spiritual truths out of it. One of the ones we can draw out of it is um, this encounter with evil, which becomes very explicit when the demons speak. Um, demons, just, I mean, let's put them in context. Um, they, are, they, are, they were originally angels. They're spirits of God. But they followed the principal uh, rebel, uh, Lucifer, who was one of the highest angels, one of the most beautiful, an angel of light, Lucifer, light. Uh, and they followed him in his rebellion against God. So pride, evil somehow took hold of their will because those spirits have a will. Uh, and they followed him. And that's the demons. And, and they, just like the, the angels of God, the guardian angels, uh, the archangels and all the choirs of angels minister to us and help do God's work. So those, those, de those demons become the dominions, the, uh, the, the servants, as it were, of their master, uh, Lucifer or Satan, the devil. I think one of the, the problems we have in sort of picturing demons is that we've got this kind of Hollywood horror film thing of, of demons that look very obviously like demons. I mean, I don't watch horror films, I couldn't. Uh, but we're sort of aware of that perception of evil. Um, so perhaps in the modern mind, we think, well, at least that happens in films. We know it doesn't happen in real life. 
the real demons because we don't see all these horrible, grotesque creatures. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a deception because demons um, probably don't manifest themselves like that, not at first. Uh, the, the angel of light, Lucifer, presents things in a, in, a, in, a, in a false light, but something that's attractive, something that's seductive. So the demons just work subtly on our inner, inner life. And Jesus is very clear. He points out the danger if you begin to have a heart that judges, if you begin to have a heart that resents, if you begin to have a heart that gets frustrated with people and wants to blame them, wants to condemn them, that's where the demons start their little work. And it's very subtle, very unseen. But gradually, of course, the more they get a foot in the door, they can take up residence. And this man seems to be filled with demons. So what happened to him, we don't know. Um, at, the, at the extreme point, yes, they become grotesque and destructive in a person's life. But this has been uh, a gradual progression or regression. But what we learn about the demons is that they're very clear about the truth. It's just that they won't abide by it. They won't assent to it. Uh, but often it's, it's the demons who know, we know who you are, Jesus, the Holy One of God. No one else really at this stage knows who Jesus is, but the demons know. Uh, often, and that's been in the, the work of exorcists, those priests who are particularly uh, consecrated to do the work of, of, to continue this particular work of, of liberating people who are possessed or oppressed by, by evil, by demons. Often they say that in their accounts afterwards, the demons come out with profound truths uh, I remember again, a slightly humorous vein, a recount, an, an account of an exorcist who said that in the middle of his uh, work with a particular soul, trying to liberate that soul, there were people around and they were praying the rosary. And at one point, out of the mouth of the person, the demon said, tell them to stop praying the Hail Mary. Tell them to stop praying the Hail Mary. This is the priest recounting this. And the priest stood there and, what, and he said, well, why? And he said, because every time they pray the Hail Mary, it's like someone hitting our heads with hammers. And um, what we make of that is a bit, bit beyond our pay grade, really, the realm of the spiritual battles going on above our heads between angels and demons and God and the devil. But it gives us an insight that they tell a the profound truth. The Hail Mary is, is, a, is, a, is a very powerful prayer. Uh, and defense against evil. And it's, it, for the demon, it's like having their head with, hit with a hammer, not a pleasant experience, even if you're a demon. Um, so profound truths. But what can we draw out of that? But the problem is with the demons is they don't, they don't bring love into that truth. They know the truth, but they don't bring love into it. They don't believe it, as it were. Not in the sense of believing with their lives and wanting to, uh, to give their existence to this truth. So they resist it. They reject it. They know the truth, but they resist it. Uh, and so we can see how, therefore, uh, how important it is, by contrast, for us to believe the truths of the faith, but not just sort of have them hanging there as, as a creed, but to let the creed be in us, to live the creed, to believe it with love, to believe it with hope, to believe it with faith. Uh, and therefore, we are part of uh, the good work that God wants to do in human lives and more and more protected against the subtle ways of the enemy and the not so subtle when he really gets a hold of someone. So let's, uh, let's contemplate this and, and uh, allow it to speak to us in whatever way. Jesus uh, restores that man's life. Unfortunately, the people around, it seems, couldn't really benefit from it. They, they asked Jesus to leave. They just couldn't handle all the drama of that day and they were afraid, but they had no reason to be afraid. Um, but in the end, Jesus saved a soul that day, and that would have been a success. But possibly he was very disappointed or sad that the others couldn't rejoice with this man who they'd been terrified of. Um, and so uh, Jesus continues his work, whether he's accepted or not. Uh, but let's pray that we could accept him, and particularly in this, this aspect of our lives, to be liberated from evil, even if it seems we're not as an extreme example. Uh, evil is always trying to harden our hearts, to destroy love uh, in our lives. So let's pray like St. Bridget, someone totally consecrated to bringing the love of God into the world and loving him with all her heart that we might follow suit in our own way uh, and live more and more according to the plan that God has for our lives.